Off the southwest coast of Scotland, there is a small Hebridean island that needs no introduction. Isla is home to some of the best whiskey distilleries in the world. I've put together a list where I'm ranking each of these distilleries to find out which one of these is the best. Hey guys, welcome back to Whiskey on the West Coast. My name is Matt, and today we're gonna to be power ranking the Isla distilleries. Now, I'm a big sports fan, as you can probably tell from all the hats I've been wearing. I got this Canucks hockey hat on here, hockey uh, poster in the background. I was at the Whitecaps football match, soccer for the North Americans, this past weekend. I love sports. Uh, and I wanted to go ahead and take the concept from sports of power rankings and apply that to distilleries. In this particular case, Isla Distilleries. So I've gone ahead and I put together a power ranking. So I want to tell you all about what I've done and then get to the list. So let's talk about the methodology I'm trying to use here, the way I'm evaluating these distilleries. So I've broken into four different categories I've gone ahead and assigned a score to, and they're weighted a little bit differently each. So the four categories I have are core range and special releases, uh, which there might be some blurred lines here because some distilleries have a more defined core range than others, but I generally have tried to go ahead and put special limited releases in, in their own category and core range whiskeys in their own. Again, there'll be some bleeding over. You'll particularly tell when I, I talk about a distillery like Brook Laddie, um, it gets a little gray. But for the actual whiskey releases from the distillery, I've weighted each of those categories out of 30. So there's 30 points for the core range and there's 30 points for the special releases. The third category I have is uh, something I'm just calling legacy. And legacy really is just like distillery history, branding, and general distillery practices, kind of like a catch-all of kind of trying to take those intangible characteristics and going ahead and evaluating those. That score, because it's not we're not drinking the history. I mean, we are in a way, but branding's one thing, history is another, whiskey's a whole other thing. That's what we really care about is what's in the bottle. So I've gone ahead and I've weighted that a little bit less out of 20 points. Lastly, the final category is independent bottlings and single casks. This I have also gone ahead and weighted out of 20 points, mainly because there's less control for the distilleries in this category. They do have their official bottling single casts that are part of this category, but anything for independent bottlers, they don't have uh, control of the presentation. So I didn't want to weight it too heavily, but it's something that we have to definitely consider because I really love independent bottlings. I know a lot of you do too. So that is kind of the general methodology that I've gone ahead and tried to put into practice for this video. Altogether, it all adds up to 100. Really easy way to understand the score if we're looking at it. Doing a list where I'm ranking all the Isla distilleries is a really intimidating thing because Isla fans are so passionate. Uh, keep in mind that this is merely based on opinion. None of this is objective fact. Um, however, um, I have my tasting preferences and what I look for in a distillery, and I'll present my case for that. And um, just know that none of these distilleries are bad. I love each and every one of these distilleries in just a different way. Uh, with that said, number nine on the list is a distillery that hasn't even released whiskey yet. And for that reason, I'm not going to rank them. I'm not going to give them a score. Ardenho, uh was opened in 2017, and I believe their first whiskey is set to be released sometime in summer 2023. So sometime after they start releasing their whiskey, we'll go ahead and maybe reevaluate them and do another list. Uh, but for now, they are not ranked. Now, number eight on this list is a distillery that's near and dear to my heart. And it pains me for them to wind up in last place, but that's just how this cookie crumbled. Uh, so number eight on this list is the Kalila Distillery. Now Kalila is a distillery that has a, a really, a, a really long history. It's been around for a long time. So we're going to start with Legacy. So again, been around a long time. Uh, it was founded in 1846, and it is actually the largest distillery on Isla in terms of capacity and output. I believe their capacity somewhere is around 6.5 million liters per annum. And they are the most consistent and largest provider of whiskey on Isla. They're exceptionally important because of um, how prominent they are in probably the some of the best-selling whiskey in the world, the Johnny Walker blends. 
Um, they are a one of the four corners of Scotland distilleries for the Diageo portfolio, and they've been a key ingredient in Johnny Walker Black, Johnny Walker Green, Johnny Walker Blue, I believe, and many other whiskeys for Diageo. Um, honestly, more of us have drank Kalila than we probably even know. Uh, on top of that, they've been included in the Flora and Fauna bottling series, and they are just... Um, they're just steady. They're just always there. They're not incredibly flashy or anything, but they're just Mr. Consistent on the island, making whiskey consistently good. I don't think I've ever had a bad Kalila. Um, and for this reason, they just have a great legacy. Uh, so I gave them a score of 16 out of 20 for their legacy. Looking at Kalila's core range, we have a 12 year old, an 18 year old, a 25 year old, a non age statement mock, which I believe is about eight years old if you do some digging online, as well as the distiller's edition, which is a Moscatel wine cask finish. Now, all of these whiskeys, sadly, are bottled at 43%, they're colored, and they're chill filtered, um, which is a shame because there's some fantastic whiskey that can come out of Kalila, but it's being held back by the way it's being treated when it's sent to the bottling plant. Um, the, the range itself is just kind of uninspiring. Um, while some of the whiskeys are good, especially that 18 year old, uh, the 12 year old, yeah, I, I, I would drink that if offered. Um, they're truly nothing that much more than average, especially for the prices that are now being asked for them. For these reasons, uh, Kalila's core range is getting a score of 15 out of 30. It's one of the things that really holds back this distillery. And I think it's something that Diageo should really look at addressing. Talking about Kalila's special releases, um, they do a number of special releases every year. Uh, typically they do a Fegio release. Last year's I believe was a 15 year old at cast strength, uh, virgin oak cask. Uh, they also had a Four Corners release that was released uh, because they went ahead and they redid the distillery visitor center in 2022. And it is of course one of the four pillars of Diageo's distilleries of Scotland, whatever they're calling that now, whatever the ridiculous branding is. They have experimented in the past with unpeated uh, Kalila uh, in 1999, and we've had uh, subsequent releases getting older and older of this unpeated uh, whiskey. I believe the first one was like eight years old and the most recent one was 18 years old. So that that's really interesting, getting to experience unpeated Kalila. That's a great, that's a great uh, little bonus there. There's some very old special releases, especially for the uh, Prima and Ultima range. Diageo's super duper expensive and exclusive ones that are only for business executives, I'm assuming. Um, so there's a 35 year old in that range. Uh, some anniversary bottlings. Honestly, at least they're putting out some special releases. Uh, that, that, that's cool. Prices range from fair to just ridiculously expensive and nothing that they have put out has really captured my imagination. I haven't felt, oh, I need to go chase that bottle. I need to find that bottle somewhere. And really, I haven't even seen that many uh, Kalila special releases in, in the flesh. I haven't seen them on store shelves. Uh, so if they're not anywhere near me and I'm not seeing them online to purchase, well, I don't know, I'm not gonna chase them. Uh, for all these reasons and more, uh, I'm giving Kalila's special release score 15 out of 30, exactly the same as the core range. Last category for Kalila is the independent bottlings and single casks. Now, I've never seen an official bottling single cask um, on a shelf. I believe they're nearly non-existent. However, independent bottlings abound. Uh, the market is flooded with independently bottled Kalila, and we are all the better for it. Honestly, it is the best thing coming out of this distillery. It's the cast strength, single casks, the secret islas, and everything else that is uh, basically Kalila just under a different label. Um, they are affordable, they're available, um, they seem to be everywhere, there's broad distribution. Um, I mean, what other Isla whiskey can you buy a cast strength 23 year old from 1997 today for about $300 Canadian? I can't think of another one that comes in that cheap. And it's almost always great. It's at least good, if not great. Cast strength Kalila is some of my favorite whiskey out there. Um, may independently bottled Kalila always be available. I don't want this ever to end Diageo don't screw this up. 
don't cut off supply or whatever you think you might do. Um, yeah, it's the best thing about this distillery. So for that reason, I've gone ahead and give them a score of 20 out of 20 for independent bottlings. Fantastic. I love it. Which gives Kalila a final score overall of 66 out of 100. That core range and the special releases really just kind of let this distillery down. But guess what? That's something that is very easy for you to fix, Diageo. Go ahead and bottle a great core range at 46% non-chill filtered natural color. I think you're going to capture the hearts and minds of uh, enthusiasts everywhere. You can do it. I believe in you. Number seven on the power rankings is none other than the Lagavulin Distillery. Now, let's talk about their legacy. 1816, they were founded. Uh, their capacity is 2.6 million liters per annum, so quite a bit of whiskey. And they have no significant history of closures. Uh, they were part of the famous White Horse Blend started in 1890. Uh, 1908, there was a distillery built uh, basically on the location called Malt Mill, which eventually became uh, the visitor center in 1962 when it closed. There's a lot of really weird and quirky history, like an explosive fire that happened in 1952. And of course, Lagavulin's 16 year old is probably one of those whiskeys that converted more people to peated whiskey than any others. That was launched, I believe, in 1988, at least part of the classic uh, malts of Scotland line that was launched in 88. Um, it is one of the highest selling whiskies through the 1990s, but low stocks allowed uh, Lafroig and Beaumore, among others, to pass them uh, in sales. They took a 30% sales hit in 2020, um, and Arbeg even passed them. Currently, they're fourth in sales among Isla distilleries at 1.7 million bottles. And unfortunately, only about 5,000 casks actually remain on Isla in the warehouses. A lot of it, if not most of it, is shipped off island. However, they are a formidable distillery with a fantastic history, a great brand, one of the most recognizable in the world. I guess we can thank Ron Swanson for that. The score for Legacy is going to be 20 out of 20. Lagavulin's core range. They got the 16-year-old, the 8-year-old, and the 12 cast strength. The 16-year-old, as we talked about, probably turned more people onto peated whiskeys than any others. Uh, the 8 is something that was brought around in 2016 for the 200th anniversary and was bottled at a really nice 48% alcohol. And the 12 cast strength is probably my favorite whiskey that Lagavulin releases. However, the 16-year-old is, is colored and is chill filtered, bottled at 43%. At least it has that 16-year-old age statement. The prices continue to go up. And it would have been nice that if the price of Lagavulin 16 was jumping up as much as it did, that they would have bumped up the, the bottling strength and presented it as an integrity malt. They didn't. That is a missed opportunity, Diageo, once again. The Lagavulin 12 cast strength, I don't think I can afford to buy it anymore. Again, that is my favorite. So now I will not be buying a bottle of the 16, and I'm probably not going to replace this 12 cast strength when it runs out. It's really sad, there's great whiskeys, but for these reasons of the prices and the lack of integrity malts, I am gonna give it a score of 21 out of 30. Lagavulin's special releases range from Fijio bottles to bottles for the Isla Jazz Festival, uh, among others. Unfortunately, I believe that Jazz Festival bottling is coming to an end, but some of the ones I really enjoyed are, in particular, the Offerman editions. The second Offerman edition is probably one of the most experimental that Lagavulin has done using a Guinness cask finish. And, and this one here is with freshly charred uh, oak casks, I believe. STR wine casks that are freshly charred, I believe. Um, outside of that, they have Prima and Ultima uh, range releases that are super old and super expensive. And prior to this, a few years ago, they had uh, Lagavulin uh, Game of Thrones edition release. Um, there's some range to the special releases. Nothing, again, terribly experimental. Prices are inching up, but not as quickly as the core range. And um, it's still quite accessible because they have quite broad distribution. For these reasons, I'm giving Lagavulin's special releases a score of 21 out of 30. Now we come to Lagavulin's Achilles heel, independent bottlings and single casks. Now I've never seen a single cask outside of distillery hand fills and for independent bottlings they are relatively scarce on the market. Um, there was at least one Lagavulin independent bottling I remember from last year from Elixir Distillers Elements of Isla, the LG 12. Uh, however, there's very few. There were some young Lagavulins that were coming out in the late 2010s. Um, 
and even some rumored secret Lagavulins under the name Log and Mill from Cooper's Choice, but outside of that, there's not really that much out there. For this reason, I'm giving uh, Lagavulin a low score on this category of 6 out of 20, which means their final score altogether is 67 out of 100. Number six on this power rankings list is the Bowmore Distillery. Now, if we're talking about their legacy score, the legacy of Bowmore Distillery is, is, is fantastic. Um, they are the oldest distillery on Isla, uh, established in 1779. They're actually the second oldest in all of Scotland, only behind Glen Turret. Their capacity for making whiskey is 2.15 million liters per annum, which is, again, quite large. Um, They're only one of three Isla distilleries that have their own floor maltings in usage right now, uh, which provides about 25% of their malt. Uh, they're second on Isla in bottles sold as uh, just over 2 million bottles in 2020. Um, and they have a really um, great history of, of amazing releases like the Black Bowmore, for instance, uh, first released in 93. Uh, 1980s Bowmore has quite a reputation of love it or hate it. Personally, I love it. There's no history of prolonged closures and their whiskey maturation warehouse, the number one vaults, is known as the oldest whiskey maturation area in the world. I believe it's even partially uh, under sea level uh, on, the, on the shores of Loch Indal. There's so much to dig into here. Their legacy score can't be anything other than 20 out of 20. Talking about Bowmore's core range, they have a 12 year old, a 15 year old, 18, 25 year old, as well as a non-age statement number one uh, release. Um, the number one and the 12 year old are both bottled at 40%, chill filtered, colored. The 15, the 18, and the 25 are all 43% uh, alcohol. They also have a limited core range release of a Bowmore 30 and 40 year old. This core range, most of it is actually quite reasonably priced. Up until about last year, I could still get the Bowmore 18 for about $100 Canadian. Uh, it's gone up a bit more now, but not as much as something like Lagavulin 16. Um, there's still some redeeming qualities to the 15 year old and 18 year old, um, even the 12 year old, there's a little bit of charm to it. However, the core range is a bit lackluster and it leaves much to be desired. Um, it could be so much better. There's so much potential here. Uh, I really think Bowmore uh, has room to improve here. They get just over a passing grade in this score. They get an 18 out of 30. For Bowmore special releases, uh, like every Isla distillery, it seems, they do have a Fegiel release that comes out every year. Last year was a 15-year-old First Fill X bourbon at cast strength. Um, they have numerous series like the Vintner series and the Vaults editions. The Vaults editions actually seemed pretty decent quality whiskeys, especially that number one sea salt. Um, they also have this ridiculous special release series with Aston Martin because it seems weird to promote cars and driving on a alcoholic beverage, something about drinking and driving, I don't know, seems a little weird. However, I wrote that release off as a gimmick, the Bowmore 21 year old, and yet it was one of the best whiskeys I tasted last year and it still kind of haunts my dreams. Um, so maybe I should uh, make sure to try that whiskey before I judge it. However, there's many multitudes of their whiskeys of special releases that are far outside my reach, like the ARC 52, 52 year old Bowmore, that's $110,000. That's eye-watering. Um, pricing seems too high for a lot of it uh, for what you get in return, um, but there's still some stunners in there like that Aston Martin Bowmore 21. For all this, they get again just above a passing mark of 18 out of 30. The last category for Bowmore to cover here is independent bottlings and single casks. Now independent bottlings do exist, uh, however they are uh, quick to sell and they can be expensive in nature. Uh, however, there are some fantastic bottlings that delivered sublime moments. Uh, there also are some really obvious secret Bowmores, such as this Isle of Violets 33-year-old, which is um, 1980s Bowmore finished in cognac casts, and it is unbelievably good. Um, for me, I love them, and there's many different bottlings like that out, out there. Uh, still, the market's not flush with independently bottled Bowmore, uh, but what is out there can be fantastic. Uh, oh. Official bottling single casts seem to mostly be limited to distillery hand fills from the number one vaults, but some of the most sublime whiskey comes from those number one vaults. For this reason, uh, they get a score of 14 out of 20, which means Bowmore Distillery is the first to crack the 70 plateau on the scoring system. They actually get exactly 70 out of 100. 
Number five on our power rankings list is the Coloman Distillery. Now, Coloman was founded in 2005 and has the smallest distillery capacity on Isla at 650,000 liters per annum. Um, they are a family owned distillery and they're actually Isla's own farm distillery. They grow their own barley and they malt it on their own malting floors for their Isla barley expressions, which come in at 20 ppm uh, as uh, opposed to their other uh, bottlings like the Sanig and the Mackier Bay and others, which use malt from Port Allen maltings, which is at 50 ppm. Um, they store and bottle all their whiskey on Isla, which is something that not all the Isla distilleries do. Young in age, first new distillery in 124 years on Isla, it's tough to build a legacy quickly, but they're doing it well with bottlings that are non-chill filter, natural color, and are really delicious. They're doing a great job at forging their legacy, and it's only gonna go up from here, is from what I can see. They get a score of 14 out of 20. Coloma's core range, uh, the regular releases are mainly Macure Bay and, and the Sanig. Macure Bay is mainly uh, reliant on ex-bourbon casts and Sanig is very much sherry focused. Um, on top of that, they have a Macure Bay cast strength, which is regularly released, a lock gorm that comes out every year, and 100% Isla barley expression. I believe this is the 10th edition. We might even be onto the 12th edition now. This is one of those moments where I was talking about it's kind of great what's a special release and what's not. I would, honestly, it comes out every year. I'm going to call this a core release. With all that said, everything's treated in integrity fashion, non-chill filter, natural color. The age statements aren't always uh, proudly displayed on the labels, but you can usually figure out how old it is because they are pretty uh, upfront about what years things come from. Uh, the price well, uh, and uh, while not an extensive core range, everything is top notch. Everything is quality and at a fair price. Uh, for these reasons, I'm going to give them 24 out of 30 for their core range score. Kiloman's special releases are, are numerous. Uh, they do Fejil bottlings annually. They're constantly experimenting with different types of finishes and maturations, uh, typically like Sauternes, PX, Madeira, Fino Sherry. There's a ton of different options out there. Uh, on top of this, they've even experimented with stuff like Mezcal uh, casks, which uh, they were doing until the Scotch Whiskey Association put a stop to it. Um, prices are average to high, but they're within reason. And again, these are really great expressions. Uh, honestly, Coloman special releases, I'm going to give them a score again of 24 out of 30. They're doing great stuff. Coloman scores for independent bottlings and single casts are difficult to drive. That's because they don't actually really sell casts to independent bottlers. As far as I can tell, there's only 12 total independent bottlings of Coloman uh, ever, seven of which are Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottlings. And the last one I could find was from 2017. However, what they've done is they've cho chosen to uh, control their own spirit, their own casks. And by doing this, they have a very extensive official bottling single cask uh, program, much like this one right here with this red label. Um, I have numerous of the, their single casts. They're fantastic. They're really great stuff. Uh, and they are actually relatively good prices. Um, I really like their single cast program. It's a good fill in. I wish we could see what uh, independent ballers like Caden Heads or Gordon McPhail could do with their spirit. Hopefully, in the future, they reconsider this and decide to spread out the love to some other independent ballers. But overall, their single cast program is great. I'm giving them a score of 12 out of 20, which means their final score overall is 74 out of 100. Well done, Coloman. Cracking the top half of this power rankings list is the Ardbeg Distillery at number four. Now Ardbeg, when we're talking about their legacy, founded in 1815, but their history goes back even longer on the distillery site, back to 1794 when the distillery was founded there at that time. Its two, capacity is 2.4 million liters per annum. It's third uh, uh, the Isla whiskeys in terms of bottles sold in 2020 at 1.8 million bottles. Um, and they've had a really interesting history that's been marred with closures. A closure in March 1981, it was mothballed in the 80s, reopened in 89, only to close again in 96. In 97, it was bought by uh, the Glen, uh, Glen Marangi, um, and it has reopened ever since. Uh, since then, they've really been committed to uh, integrity, bottling, naturally presented whiskey. In 2000, the Ardbeg Committee was founded and they have over 130,000 members. And the Ardbeg Committee releases are some of the most popular whiskeys uh, that are released every year from an Isla distillery. Um, they even have some uh, interesting things back from like 1979 with uh, uh, lower peated Kill Dalton releases uh, from Ardbeg. It's a really interesting history, it's really rich, and they make some fantastic whiskeys, and they even have their own little cult that follows every release. Overall, I'm giving them a legacy score of 16 out of 20. 
The core range is really where Ardbeg shines. Their five-year-old wee beastie, their 10-year-old, the Ugdal, Corivrekin, and oh, a 25-year-old are all part of the core range. They're all bottled at a minimum 46% alcohol, non-chill filtered, natural color. Some are even higher. Most are even higher, honestly. They're all priced very reasonably, but it is market dependent. However, from distillery prices, really well priced. Um, the core range is probably the best core range on Isla. Uh, the Ardbeg 10 is one of the very best and most accessible bottlings on Isla. The Wee Beastie is a really brave and excellent, um, fiery five-year-old. Uh, Ugi is a cult classic. Cory Vrecken's probably my favorite of their core range. And unfortunately, at the 25-year-old and the 19-year-old semi-regular uh, release, the Tregban, or however you say it, that's where it kind of goes off the range because we're talking about 1,000 pounds for the 25-year-old uh, or plus, uh, 260 pounds for the 19-year-old. However, the rest of the core range and the true core range, fantastic. 30 out of 30, you can't beat Ardbeg's core range. Ardbeg's special releases have been some of the most sought after whiskies in recent whiskey history. Names like Supernova, Ardbog, Dark Cove, Kelpie Black, and others, they can elicit pandemonium really from fanatics uh, and Islophiles. However, um, more recently there's been a real shift in the special releases and it really seems to be marketing run awry overall. Add to this um, that the latest releases like Ardcore have kind of just fallen flat. Um, on top of this, we have this blockchain bottling that was sold uh, as a cask buried under peat bogs, and you had to buy it through Ethereum, uh, $2,500 worth of cryptocurrency. Marketing gimmicks like this fell flat with the community. I think it really started to turn uh, perception against Ardbeg. It's the height of ridiculousness. Fur mutation um, was received mixed reviews. Smoke Trails Manzanilla travel uh, exclusive. Um, Again, mixed things, but overall positive. It really is a mixed bag, but the problem is they were once the kings of special releases and now they're losing their grasp on that title. Um, so Ardbeg, unfortunately, you would have expected a higher score a few years ago, but now you're going to be getting a 21 out of 30. Ardbeg has some history of releasing single casks on a semi-regular basis, and they still do. These casts can be quite expensive, obviously, because Ardbeg is so popular. We do see the occasional um, independent bottling still coming out. Um, they aren't as frequent as, say, some like Bonahaven, Brooklady, or Kalila. However, they're, they're out there. Adam Brands, their Darkness label 2022 had an Ardbeg release. Boutique in 2022 had Ardbeg releases. Same with Caden Heads. There's some value that can be out there in secret bottlings of Ardbeg. Uh, something like this, the Kill Naughton from Cooper's Choice, I've been told, is Ardbeg, uh, and this is a Rioja finish. So that's really interesting, but we can't confirm it's Ardbeg, so I can't really include that in the score. Um, they had the historic sale of a single cask of whiskey to a whiskey collector uh, for a record 16 million pounds in 2022, which just shows you how ridiculous prices are going to start going or already have become for Ardbeg single casks. Largely due to the lack of releases uh, and stock and, and bottlings, uh, they just get a mark just above a pass at 12 out of 20. That means their total score is a 79 out of 100. And again, they're in the top four here. Just on the podium at number three is the Bunahaven Distillery. Now, the legacy of Bunahaven, they're founded in 1881. They have a capacity of 2.7 million liters per annum. They've gone through some uh, closures. They were mothballed in the 80s. They reopened, and they've always ha really had a good reputation as like kind of a working man's whiskey. Um, recent changes to how it's handled and treated have been see uh, received very well. Uh, Distel's uh, kind of signature ABV to be bottled at for the core range is 46.3%. Um, they really treat the whiskey well, typically unchill filtered, natural color. I don't know anything that they do that they isn't. Uh, those things and the Bunhaven 12 is a great flagship brand it's really a great value and it performs very well uh, they have broad appeal through their unpeated whiskey which is what they're mainly known for but also the peated whiskey their Moin distillate uh, overall great legacy so far I'm sure it might even get even better 16 out of 20 is the score for the legacy the steady presence at the helm uh, the helmsman's done a great job Bunnhaven's core range is formidable. Uh, they have a, their uh, regular 12-year-old, 18-year-old, their 25-year-old. They have a 40-year-old. They also have the new 12 cast strength, which has at least two batches out right now. Again, I consider that a core range bottling because it seems like it's going to be a regular presence uh, in their lineup uh, going forward. 
Uh, everything's bottled in integrity fashion, non-chill filtered, natural color, very reasonably priced, especially that 12 year old. Uh, but I haven't 12 really is the flagship bottling. The 18 has a reputation for having older whiskey in it and is honestly my favorite of the bottlings I've had of the core range. 12 cast strength has really received some notoriety online, especially batch two. The non-age statement Sturridur, which I haven't mentioned yet, um, really presents a great value uh, proposition, uh, actually cheaper than the 12 year old. And the Toitikaga uh, is kind of their introduction to peated whiskey expressions. It kind of replaced the, the Kibonic, uh, which was, uh, I think they had three batches of before that. So really uh, great uh, core range. To top this off, their 25 year old is at a phenomenal price and is a great whiskey. Overall, 30 out of 30 all day long. I love this range. When it comes to special releases, Bunnahopin really seemed to focus on Fijio last year, releasing three different uh, whiskeys for it. A 22-year-old Calvados, a Moine Bordeaux cask, and an unpeated Sherried uh, whiskey. Uh, they also have one-offs like the 2008 Manzanilla cask, uh, which I really enjoyed. It was at cast strength, phenomenal whiskey. They had a 1997 PX recently, and they have numerous Moine bottlings, which are very popular peated expressions. Uh, they're constantly experimenting with unusual finishes like uh, Calvados and uh, Tokai uh, casks. And uh, their availability of larger special releases is actually pretty good. Uh, the price can be a little high, uh, but it's not completely out of this world. Um, some are extremely well received. Uh, the Moin Ballings especially, that 2008 uh, Manzanilla is it's mint. Uh, but some are more hit and miss. Overall, I'd give a score of 21 out of 30 for the Bunnahaven special releases. For Buna have and score on independent bottlings and single casts, I have to mention that single casts don't really seem to exist in official form. I'm sure you can get distillery handfuls. In fact, I know you can, uh, especially if you take their, their warehouse tour. Um, however, um, the market is flooded with independent bottling uh, options, which really makes up for it regardless. Uh, they're affordable, they're available, they're generally of really high quality. They have broad distribution. I can think of almost dozens of Bunnahaven uh, independent bottlings that I can pick up in my market. Um, they're independently bottled uh, Stoisha, uh, peated uh, Bunnahaven, is fantastic. And when young is actually really super affordable, at least has been, it's starting to go up uh, like everything else. They're really only second to Kalila in their independent bottling choices and availability, and some value can be found in secret bottlings. For instance, uh, the Portiskeg 40-year-old is a Bunahaven, but at a huge discount. Um, for these reasons, 18 out of 20 is their score for independent bottlings and single casks, which means their total score, their final score, is 85 out of 100. Uh, solidly at number three, just missing out on number two. Runner up on our list is Lefroig Distillery. Now, in terms of legacy, founded in 1815, they have a 3.3 million liter capacity and a really interesting history of early rivalries with the Ardenstiel Distillery and even kind of Lagavulin. Um, one of the founding uh, brothers, Donald Johnson, he actually died when he fell into a vat of his own whiskey and the, the distillery was taken over for 10 years by the Lagavulin Distillery Manager. Really interesting stuff. Ian Hunter ran the distillery for about 46 years. Bessie Williamson, one of the most influential women in Scotch, uh, was uh, head of the distillery for a number of years as well. Um, 1994, Friends of Lefroig was founded, which is a Lefroig uh, fan club. In 1995, the 10 year old cast strength, my favorite expression in the core range right here, uh, was released. Um, it's known the world over for its characterful and unique taste and smell, and it's even loved by royals, as you can see by this royal seal here from uh, Prince, or I guess King Charles now. The marketing campaigns for them have made it uh, known the world over. Things like it tastes like a mermaid's bath water really stick with you. Um, its warehousing is on location, has partial floor maltings. Uh, about 15% of uh, its maltings uh, or malt comes from its maltings. They use local peat. They're number one in sales on Isla for the last two decades, usually selling somewhere between 3.7 to 4 million bottles a year. Um, this one of the most recognizable whiskey brands on the planet, both in brand and palette, I cannot give them any other score other than 20 out of 20. Lefroy actually has a very large core range. Uh, they, it starts with their select of 40% uh, ABV. The 10 year old, depending where you are, is anywhere from 40 to 43%. 
10 year old sherry oak was added a couple years ago at 48% and is a really welcome addition uh, with that sherry uh, aspect. The quarter cask originally released somewhere around like 2004 is uh, one of my favorites in the core range and it's uh, bottled at 48% and non-chill filtered. The triple wood I believe is discontinued but it was an interesting expression. The 10 cast strength is phenomenal. It's absolutely fantastic. Some would say it's a special release but it's been coming out regularly for gosh 20 years now something like that um the lore is non-age statement but it's basically teenage uh Lefroig, and there's also a series of 25 year old cast strength releases mix of presentation styles uh coloring filtration bottling strengths i wish it was all integrity um you know unchill filtered natural color um and a uh, bottled above like 46 percent but um, it's still really nice whiskey. I gotta judge it on whether it tastes good. It tastes great, most of it. Um, exceptional distribution and, and reach really the world over. It's an entirely peated range, but there's a range of experiences within that. Um, yeah, it's a great core range. 24 out of 30 is the score. Lefroy's special releases are really centered around the Fegiel bottling, the Karchis release, which is kind of the friends of Lefroy uh, bottling. Uh, first released in 2008, it's uh, one of the bottles I really look forward to every year because it is usually absolutely delicious and it's really fairly priced, really competitively priced, especially if you compare it to something like the Ardbeg Committee releases these days. Um, just a great value proposition. Um, on top of that, uh, they have one off extra aged 20 something year old whiskeys that get uh, bottled at cast strength really sporadically. They have the five part Ian Hunter story, which I think the fifth part is coming out sometime in the next year or so. Um, and uh, numerous travel retail exclusives too, including the uh, Bessie Williamson story, 25 year old. Prices on the non karchis releases are a lot higher. Uh, so really the value is really in the karchis release like this one here, the warehouse one. Really, um, I really appreciate that release. And again, I look forward to it every year. I'm gonna give them a score of 24 out of 30 for the special releases. Last up for Lefroig is the uh, uh, independent bottlings and single casks. Now for official bottling single casks, you really are limited, it seems, to distillery hand fills, uh, which you can only get if you're taking the Warehouse One Tour, is my understanding. Otherwise, they seem really rare. However, uh, independent bottlings are frequent and abundant. Um, on top of that, older bottlings, they can be very expensive, even teenage Lefroig, like 14 year olds at $400 Canadian, pretty pricey. However, young Lefroig, is really, really affordable. Um, it's inexpensive. Um, watch out for secret Lefroigs uh, under the name of Williamson, named after Bessie Williamson, or even uh, something that's not so uh, hidden, like a, a name like Leapfrog. Um, these are secret Lefroigs and they represent really good value. Um, the independent expressions of Lefroig are some of the best uh, ways you can taste Lefroig, and I'm really appreciative of them out there. I just wish some of the prices on the older stuff were, were lower. But who doesn't wish that? Nearly perfect score. I'm going to give it 18 out of 20 for independent bottlings and single casks, which means their overall score is an 86 out of 100. Very well done, Lefroig. I love you. What can I say? We're coming to the end of our marathon power rankings uh, session here. And I just want to thank you all for being with me so far. Um, I've been really feeling the love from the whiskey community. You guys are the best. Uh, I love the comments that you're leaving and just thank you so much for all the encouragement. Um, yeah, it's been really exciting and really wonderful to see. Um, if you have an opinion, I'm sure you do. If you've watched this far, please go ahead and comment down below. What is your power ranking of the Isla distilleries? And if you haven't already, please go ahead and like, like subscribe. Um, and, and comment on more videos. Again, I really appreciate it and I love engaging with you guys. All right, let's talk about our number one distillery on this list. One of my absolute favorites, probably my favorite on Isla, if I'm being honest. I'm a little biased. Um, you might see that in the scores, but hey, it's an opinion. Um, we're gonna talk about Brook Laddie. Now, Brook Laddie, in regards to legacy, founded in 1881, the same year as Bunahaven. Uh, they have a capacity of 2 million liters per annum. Um, there was a series of closures throughout the 20th century. Most recently in 1994, they reopened in 2001 with Mark Rainier and uh, Jim McEwen uh, taking over. Um, since then, Adam Hannett has taken over for Jim McEwen and he's really putting his own stamp on Brook Laddie now as well. Uh, the modern 
era ethos of the progressive Hebridean uh, distillers has worked wonders. Um, innumerable new expressions, uh, integrity bottlings only since it was uh, re it reawoken, and terroir-driven expressions like the Isla Barley and the Bear Barley, these sorts of things. Really interesting and really cool. Um, one of the few distilleries on Isla that actually stores and bottles all its whiskey on the island. Um, there's broad appeal through three, really four different styles of whiskey, uh, if you include Lock and Doll, or five if you include the small amount of rye they make. Um, they are Isla's largest private employer, uh, employing roughly about 110 employees, which is unbelievable for a small island for them to employ so many. And Interestingly enough, they're, they're B Corp accredited, which I had to look into, uh, but basically it means they're not just legally, but morally required, um, or they're legally not just morally required to uh, consider the impact of their decisions on the environment, on their workers, suppliers, community, and customers. Again, there's a, a really uh, thoughtful uh, ethos at Brook Lottie, and I'm loving it. Um, yeah, they're doing great stuff. Nearly perfect score for Legacy, 18 out of 20. Brook Laddie's core range really is probably only the classic Laddie and the Port Charlotte 10, which is really sparse. However, every year they have these releases that come out, uh, the Brook Laddie Isla Barley, Bear Barley, Organic, uh, the Port Charlotte Isla Barley, even the Octomore 0.1s, 0.2s, 0.3s, they've been coming out for over a decade. So really uh, the only thing about them is just that there's batch variation, which is true for any whiskey. I kind of consider it an extended core range because they have so many special releases to talk about in that category anyways. Um, so this is a little great. However, um, their core range, naturally presented, non-chill filtered, natural color, always over 50% ABV. There's a lot of value there and they make really great whiskey. I can't stop talking about them. I love Brook Lottie. Um, the only weakness I'd say is a lack of a really mature age statement. They don't hide their age statements. You can find them on the website. However, they don't have that like 15 year old, that 18 year old. They don't really even have that 10 year old for the unpeated. Um, so that is the one place where they really could improve. And I've heard rumors that there may be an 18 year old in the works in the near future. For that reason, they get a 27 out of 30 for their core range. When it comes to special releases, nobody seems to do it better than Brook Laddie. Um, again, depends how you define special, but their Black Art series is all pre-closure whiskey. Older age statements, the latest one, the 10, no, the, yeah, the 10.1 is 29 year old Bro uh, Brook Laddie. Port Charlotte Exploration Series, series of different cask uh, finishes. Recently, the SCO one is a So Turns cask. Octomore 0.4 is virgin oak. It rotates year uh, on year with the 10 year old expression. Uh, their fi uh, Fijial uh, release last year was the Rock and Dolls, uh, two different versions, uh, which I believe one was a mixture of the three different types, common types of Brook Lottie. Rare Cast series, super uh, aged, super old, really like 28 to 30 year old age statements. The Valanche series is really interesting because they're 500 ml bottlings selected by employees at Brook Lottie, and the labels are actually pictures of those employees. Really cool shout out to their workers. I love what they're doing. They even have even more special releases, the Ternary Project, the Biodynamic Project, etc. Um, prices are a mixed bag, um, but they're nothing out of step with the industry. There's just so much choice. Uh, score has to be 30 out of 30. Fantastic stuff. You can never run out of Brook Lottie expressions. Lastly, the independent bottlings and uh, single cast from Brook Lottie. Um, they, there was so much on the market a few years ago. A good supply of official bottling single casts like this micro provenance range here. Um, they really do a good job of, of pushing them into Alberta here in Canada. Um, Again, market formerly flooded with options. It's getting a little thinner now because they seem to be selling less casks because they're trying to hold more back to get more mature whiskey in their own stocks. However, Boutique Whiskey Company still has 20 plus year old bottlings coming out, archives, first editions, whiskey agency. They're still in independent bottlings uh, frequently being released. Um, so if you don't get it from the official bottling single casks, you could get it from them. Also, they were very aggressive in selling private casks early on in their reawakening of the distillery. That's how we get something like this here from Talent Distillery in British Columbia. They released a series of five private casks. Uh, this one's a reef salts cask. Um, so you'll find a lot of private casks out there on the markets or at auction. Um, so they're circulating broadly. Um, really, younger independent bottlings seem to have dried up, um, but 
the uh, middle-aged to older-aged uh, independent bottlings are still out there being released. Um, a lot of it is very delicious, and you can even find a specific type of Brooklady called Lock and Doll that's peated somewhere between Port Charlotte and Octomore. It's the only place I know where you can find Lock and Doll. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot out there. I just wish they were still releasing more, but I understand they have to take care of their own mature product. They're gonna get a score <clears throat> of 16 out of 20 in this uh, in this category, which means their total score is a whopping 91 out of 100. The only distillery to crack the 90s. They are our winner in the power rankings of Isla Distilleries. So to recap, we had Kalila number eight, Lagavulin number seven, Bowmore six, Kiloman five, cracking the top half. We had Ardbeg coming in number three, Bunahaven just missing out in second place, Lafroig, and our winner tonight, Brooke Laddie. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. I really appreciate it. My voice is starting to go. This has been a marathon. Leave a comment down below again. Subscribe if you haven't. Come back for more in the future. Thank you once again from the West Coast. Slantja.